All right, welcome to Give Me an Answer. Today we're going to be talking about free will and predestination. So, where are humans in the process of performing and acting out in this world versus God's sovereignty? How in control is God truly? Even before starting this discussion, though, I think it's really important to think through how heated this one can get. Uh, There's been a few people who've left our church in tremendous anger in the past, years ago, when they've said, all right, clearly you guys aren't strong enough on predestination, so we're we're out. Um, I've had to split up a couple intense arguments between people over Arminianism and Calvinism, predestination, free will. I think it's really important, this is my favorite illustration of all time, on how to respond and how to converse graciously over a tough, tough topic. I'm sure everyone will know John Wesley, George Whitfield. George Whitfield was strong, strong Calvinist. Wesley, strong into free will, Arminianism. One day after Whitfield's decease, John Wesley was timidly approached by one of the godly band of Christian sisters who had been brought under his influences and who loved both Whitfield and himself. Dear Mr. Wesley, may I ask you a question? Yes, of course, madame, by all means. But, dear Mr. Wesley, I'm very much afraid what the answer will be. Well, madame, let me hear your question, and then you will know my reply. At last, after not a little hesitation, the inquirer tremblingly asked, Dear Mr. Wesley, do you expect to see Dr. Mr. Whitfield in heaven? A lengthy pause followed, after which John Wesley replied with great seriousness, No, madame. His inquirer at once explained, Ah, I was afraid you would say so. To which John Wesley added, with intense earnestness, Do not misunderstand me, madame. George Whitfield was so bright a star in the firmament of God's glory, and will stand so near the throne that one like me, who am less than the least, will never catch a glimpse of him. Tremendous humility, graciousness, kindness to somebody who in many ways, especially in that time period, was considered a real competitor, someone on the other end. How do you think through predestination and free will? People a lot more intelligent than I will ever be have disagreed strongly on this question. And so you're right, Stuart, this has been a hot topic for some people. It's been very divisive, and there's been a lot of hurt feelings. The scriptures, I'm convinced, reveal that God is all-powerful, Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the eternal, all-powerful creator of heaven and earth. Amazing power. Not only that, but he loves us. And by his Holy Spirit, he reaches out to draw us to himself. So God initiates the salvation process. I don't love God because I'm a great guy. I love God because he reached out to me. He initiated. So God is sovereign. But the Bible also reveals that God has given us a free will. In Joshua 24, 15, Joshua stands before the people of Israel and says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves. John three sixteen, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter writes, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you have these two ideas juxtaposed together, and the challenge is, how do you bring those two ideas together? The Apostle Paul communicates these two ideas side by side in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul writes, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's human responsibility. That's free will. You are responsible to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then he concludes, for it is God who is at work within you. There's the sovereignty of God. God is at work within you. God initiated. God's at work in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. Now he puts those two ideas side by side right there in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And he doesn't explain how they fit together. And therefore, I'm convinced we don't ultimately know how they fit together. But we do know that God is sovereign, he's all-powerful, and we do know that we have a free will 
It's so free that there will be a hell where God judges us and holds us responsible, not for the decisions he made, rather for the decisions we made to shut him out of our lives to run away from him. Now, one of the passages of Scripture that causes a lot of consternation on this topic is the book of Exodus. Pharaoh had his heart hardened by God. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The interesting thing is, in Exodus, there are two predictions about Pharaoh hardening his heart. Then there are seven statements. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then there are six statements. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So once again, you've got this interesting juxtaposition of ideas. My understanding is Pharaoh hardened his heart and hardened his heart and hardened his heart and got to the point where God said, all right, sir, if you continue to make that kind of decision and harden your heart, then I remove myself. And when God removes himself, it's expressed as the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. This idea is brought out also in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul talks about people chose to disobey God and then God essentially gave them over to the sinful desires that they had. In other words, people chose freely to harden themselves, to walk away from God with such great repetition and consistently that they reached a point where we read God sends them a delusion so that they believe the lie. So it's a very difficult question, but once again, I don't think it's an issue that should divide followers of Christ. We understand that God is all-powerful. We understand that God has given us free will, and he holds us responsible for the decisions we made. One I get when we're on college campuses together on a regular basis is, okay, God predestined that atrocity to happen, so he's not a good God. When I think of predestination and God having foreknowledge that an atrocity would happen, that doesn't mean he wills it to happen. He's outside of space and time, so yes, in a way it's fated, he knows it. It is predestined in the sense of he's outside of space and time and sees that it will happen. And yet that does not mean he wills it, that he's behind the enemy actually doing this, that he's actually driving the storm to wreck the boat or to wreck the island or driving the tsunami to kill 250,000 people. I see a big difference between willing and having the foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. A couple other examples would be Nehemiah 4.9, when they've gone back and Nehemiah is leading the group to rebuild the wall around Jer Jerusalem, and they have enemies who are heckling them and even going to attack them. Mm. So what do they do? They pray and post a guard. Pray and post a guard. Mm -hmm. So that's God's sovereignty in praying and then posting a guard. That's their own free will kicking in mm -hmm. and being wise in order to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Think of Acts chapter 2, Peter's first sermon. What does he say? He says, it was foreordained, there was knowledge, it was predestined that Jesus would hang on a cross for our sins, and yet you put him there. Mm -hmm. Human beings put him there. So again, it's that tremendous combination, the nuanced combination mm -hmm. of both in play. Now, free will and predestination, logically to me, don't make sense. I think similar to the Trinity, there is tremendous mystery behind it. Practically, it makes a lot of sense to me with those kinds of examples, because I think God's sovereignty is still at work, but practically he uses us in the world with our own free will. Now. But people have oftentimes a very tough time of this when it comes to prayer. When I think through my own personal prayer life, it would be ironic of me and also pretty egotistical if I think I could change God's mind and change the will of God every single time I pray. Now, that's kind of tough to swallow because we think, yeah, but God is using us with our own free will to reach out to him. 
I find that dangerous though, because in that, that can lead to this whole type of hedge of protection type of prayer, which can be used at times as, as good. But I've heard it abused when one man who lost his whole family in a car accident said he didn't pray enough for the hedge of protection. Mm-hmm. And so it's an abuse of prayer. And so he has all this guilt and shame on him for the rest of his life, unless he changes his theology on, he didn't pray to change God's mind to protect his family, this hedge of protection. Mm-hmm. That's an ab- an, a tremendous abuse in understanding what correct theology is and the grace of God. So how do you think through praying to change God's mind or is are things predestined and you're not going to change God's mind? Is it too high of a view of yourself? Where does humility come into play? And yet we're obviously called to pray. How do, how do you think through that one? Every time God and human beings intersect, there's going to be a lot of mystery around that. I don't care if it's the Bible, the Word of God written in human language, the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, becoming a human being. How does that happen? Every time that God and human beings intersect, there's going to be a lot of mystery shrouding what is exactly happening. The same is true for prayer. Prayer is me seeking to connect with God. Exactly how does God use my prayers? I don't know. I do know that James writes in James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So it seems to me that what God does is he uses our prayers to bring about his will. Well, what does that mean and exactly how does that work out? I don't know. But I do know that God takes our prayers seriously. He uses them in some way that I do not totally understand. All right. Well, thinking more through this issue, be gentle. Be humble this week and the week following in thinking through such a tough issue. There's so much mystery behind it. At times, it's not logical, but I believe God has made it very practical. But this could be as serious as politics in terms of its divided friendships. I know some. And our forefathers ourselves, Zwingli, Swiss priest, minister, his own disciples were the first ones to go about starting the theology of believer's baptism. And he told on them, and the authorities came, and they drowned his disciples based off of simply a disagreement on theology over infant baptism versus believer's baptism. Well, we're not much different in this day and age. We can be just as divisive, just as judgmental and self-righteous. So it's crucial to think clearly and then to respond like a John Wesley with tremendous grace, tremendous truth to a George Whitfield. George Whitfield.